Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. Would you like to put your business in front of rural America and the ag community every week? We have sponsorship opportunities available that will do just that. Contact us to find out how you can, you can milk it for all it's worth. Virginians have been farming for more than 400 years now. There's a lot of history that spans from growing tobacco in Jamestown to producing wine grapes in Loudoun County. This week, we visit a unique museum focused on preserving our agricultural legacy. We also have a story this week about cattle markets and where they might be headed. Plus, we have some tips on growing garlic in your own backyard garden. Welcome to this episode of Virginia Farming. I'm Jeff Ishy. Well, Virginia farmers have had a good harvest season, at least so far. A relatively mild summer with spotty rain has turned into a dry fall in some areas. But that's not necessarily bad news. Dry weather in late September allowed apple orchards and wine grape growers to bring in high quality fruit. Some farmers say dry conditions actually intensify the flavor profile in the fruit. Meanwhile, corn harvest in Virginia is progressing well with about 75% of corn for grain off the field at the beginning of October. Other farming activities for early October include harvesting peanuts, planting winter wheat, and monitoring soybean development. Well, the Virginia Department of Agriculture is emphasizing an important food safety program which could have an impact on Virginia vegetable and fruit growers. The Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Safety Rule it's now being implemented across the state. It focuses on science-based minimum standards for the safe growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of fruits and vegetables grown for human consumption. Small farms with sales under a certain dollar amount, you may be exempt from these new standards. To determine your status, just contact the Virginia Department of Agriculture this fall or simply call your local office of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Virginia cattlemen are watching the market situation closely this fall. Bob Severa has this report from the American Angus Association. An ag resource market analyst says opportunities in agriculture are beginning to look up. We are not as bearish of agriculture as been over the last three or four years. Agricultural uh, opportunities seem to be bottoming out. The, the, we, we believe the banker is uh, cutting back in some of his lending. But we do believe that this year's corn and soybean crop won't be as large as last year. Uh, we see the U.S. corn yield between 164 and 166 bushels an acre, maybe soybeans 47, 47 and a half, and that will provide some levity. We also like the opportunity from China in beef. We think that the Chinese will be looking for beta agonist free beef sometime in early 2018, and that will provide an opportunity along with strong consumer demand, domestic demand, to get some uh, improving beef prices and cattle prices as we look forward to the first and second quarter of 2018. Bossy believes drought in the northern plains pushed cattle placements earlier. And that means lower prices in the near term will improve into next year. And that combination of seasonality and fewer supply should give us a run up to maybe $124, $128 uh, per uh, cent weight. And then thereafter, we should start to see prices easing down. But we're going to bottom, we think, in the fourth quarter, somewhere between 100 to 104. So it is a nice run to the upside as we look forward to 2018. Other countries cutting back numbers and increased domestic and export demand will also bolster prices. Consumers are eating more beef in this country than we've seen in an awful long time. We have to go back to 2008. So uh, increasingly lower beef prices has caused the consumer to reach for supply. And we think that this is something that will continue. So uh, going forward, the strong domestic demand, better export interest, particularly from China, should give us that demand pull market as supplies tighten and we look forward. Bossy advises cattle feeders to look for breaks in the market to secure feedstuffs. 
We say that because as yields come down and farmers find out they don't have all of the crop they had in years prior, that they will be stronger stores of grain and we'll see more demand coming from China in terms of soybeans. So we think the next couple of weeks are key for the U.S. feedlot industry to get some stuff priced. Bossy also says it's not a strongly bullish market, but it's bullish nonetheless. I'm Bob Cervera. Thank you, Bob, for that report. Well, if you had to guess what the leading organic crop raised in Virginia is, would you guess tobacco? A recent survey by the USDA found that tobacco accounts for 33% of all sales of organic agricultural products in Virginia. Growers raised more than $18 million worth of organic leaf tobacco in 2016. A significant portion of that product is being exported to European markets where uh, organic tobacco is evidently all the rage. Well, in just a few more weeks, farmers across the nation will start receiving the 2017 Census of Agriculture. Producers can mail in their completed census form, or they can respond online by using an improved web-based questionnaire. Officials with the National Agricultural Statistics Service say that they have now revised the online questionnaire extensively to make it more convenient for producers. They say the more data they have, the better decisions can be made concerning farm policy. The agricultural census is conducted every five years. More information is available at the website agcensus.usda.gov. Well, Virginia recently celebrated Farm to School Week. It's an annual program coordinated by the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, as well as the Virginia Department of Education. The program is now in its 10th year, and it, it raises awareness of fresh Virginia-grown products available throughout the year. Virginia was one of the very first states to join the national effort. Uh, the goal was to connect schools with fresh foods from local farms. Now, 10 years down the road, the program not only increases market opportunities for Virginia farmers, but it also helps more than 800,000 school children understand where their food comes from. Well, farms and forests are a major part of our agricultural legacy in Virginia. This week, we have a special report on a, a unique museum. It's in Southampton County. Amy Rocher has the story. It's coming up next during Ag Insights. Today we're in Southampton County and we're visiting the Museum of Agriculture and Forestry and I'm joined by one of the museum's director, Bill Vick. Bill, thank you so much thank for you. having us out today. And we also have a what we call Heritage Village with all the houses and things It's around. not just a one building museum. No. You have got, you've, 29, you've I got think. an amazing display here. Well, not just the stuff that's behind us. I mean, you've got so many different different buildings and right. things to see. It, it's very interesting. Well, I find it interesting. I, I have been chairman for about 10 years. And uh, every day I walk in here, I find something. I found something today right. that I had not seen before. It was just laying up there. See? And so let's talk a little bit about some of the things you have here, especially pertaining to agriculture. What are some things that people could expect to see when they visit? Well, we have uh, uh, plows and we have uh, a grist mill where we grind our corn meal. We have a saw mill that we saw boards. Uh, we have a small hummingbird's nest over in one building. We have a pine tree growing through a sycamore tree in one building. Wow. Uh, we even have a liquor still in here that was donated. It's not in use, but sure, uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but we everything once it comes in the gate, it's ours, donated. Right. And you can see on the shelf over there, I have a lot of items that have been donated that we have not yet cataloged and put into the into the museum. I think it's great that people donate and want and want people to keep remembering history because I think That's sometimes right. we're losing that with our younger generation. Well, I put my children's playpen in the country building over here and my typewriters up here and things that I don't use anymore. Right. But we have school groups that come through and I'd like to have more. 
And so we give tours. And Now I saw you have a display of uh, toy tractors. Yes. And you also have a display of hand tools. Right. What are some other things that are that are in here that would be of interest to agriculture folks? Well, um, I showed you the newspapers. Yes. We have two printing presses that we can make, and they run, and we print with them. And so when we get ready to do the hog killing, we have all of that back in there. Uh, we have old tractors. We even have a chicken plucker, which is a, has rubberized prongs that stick out. Really? That I can't imagine using that, but it turns over with a motor and it does and it that. And gets the feathers out. And we do a lot of uh, forestry work. Uh, agriculture, we, we try to promote the plows that have been developed over the years. Mm -hmm. And some of them I had never seen before. Lots of changes. Oh, my land. You know, over 100 years, you see, you've seen a lot of changes in, well, in my in, lifetime, in, the, in my lifetime. No, I'm not saying you're 100, no. but I'm saying... <laughs> <laughs> Only 80. But when you think back about uh, around the span of 100 years, how much our equipment has changed right. and how much easier it is on the human body. Right. You know, right. And, and we rely more on, I guess, tractors as opposed to because horses. Because of people having to work on the farm as they did, many people did not make 50 years old. Right. So the lifespan has really jumped. Absolutely. And so, uh, but farming is just, I never thought that I'd be doing what I'm doing because I got away from the farm, went into teaching, and then once I retired, it just fell into place. Just, it was I, just meant to be, right? It was meant to be. Now, how long has this museum been here? Uh, 25 years. 25 years, okay. Now, we talked earlier about some of the buildings. Tell us some of the buildings that people could see when they come visit. All right, we have a one-room schoolhouse, uh, which goes from first grade to eighth grade. We have a country home, and we've just added a back porch to that. We have a dentist office. We have a... Um, four-seater outhouse. A four-seater? Four-seater. That's community, isn't it? Wow, okay. Well, I, wouldn't, I don't know how that was That's only for family? Out. I hope so. And we have a country kitchen that uh, the kitchens were not built onto the house. They were about 20, 25 feet away. Mm -hmm. And if the kitchen caught on fire, your house did not catch on fire. So and it that was also was, heat. You know, when right. they would cook in the summer. Oh, yes. It would, it would make the house so hot you could, could hardly stand it. So I remember seeing that in some other places. And we have an ice house. Really? Which is interesting. And they use sawdust in the floor and up the walls. And when the river froze over, you collected ice, packed it in there, and that was your ice for the, for the year. Okay. Now, I can remember when uh, the, we stuck a tag on your post on the front of the house and the ice man would get five pounds, 10 pounds, whatever you had at the top. And he would stop at the house and he would chip off the block, bring it in and put it in the, in the house. Really? So it, it's really, it's amazing. I don't know what the future is gonna be. I can't, I can't believe things will change so much, but neither could I believe things that have changed like that. Right. Now, there's one house in particular on the property I wanted you to tell me the story behind. Um, it has to do with Nat Turner. All right. Uh, this house is up here, and it was moved here, and it was in real poor condition. And that's under the historical society of which we are a part. And we are uh, fixing that house up, and we hope to uh, have a museum there. Uh, and we have a walking tour that you can take. He was hung here in Southampton County. Uh, the rebellion came about because of what we think was an eclipse. And his mother was a very religious and an unusual woman, and she said, now is the time to strike. A lot of slaves were not treated nice. Many slaves were treated well. But uh, it's, it's, it's quite interesting, and uh, it's part of history. And it's uh, here on it, the grounds for here. everyone to it's see. It's here, right. Now, a few minutes ago, you mentioned something about butchering. Killing hogs. Do you guys do that here? No, no. Okay. But we have a young man who is a member of our organization that is the official photographer for hog killings, 
and so he has a display in the back and he and his wife uh, stand and with an easel and they explain all of that okay. to people coming through. Interesting. One so lady got lot real of... upset because she said, can't imagine you treating a hog like that. And someone wrote back and said, how do you think you get the meat out of the counter in the store? So right. that got <laughs> real controversial. Right, absolutely. So there's a lot of education that goes on oh, here yes. for oh, everything. Yes. And I wanted to talk a little bit, you guys have a field day every year and yeah. that's a that's some pretty big doings tell us a little well, bit we about actually that. have two we, have, we two. have down home day in april okay which is a small scale of heritage day which is in september heritage okay and we have crafters to come in we run our sawmill we grind eight nine hundred pounds of cornmeal which is for sale and uh, we uh, have country music we, this year we'll have a big tractor display i understand we have some antique cars. Uh, we have a petting zoo. Uh, we'll have some horseback riding for the kids. So it's a big day. Wow. It's big. It sounds like a big day. It is fun. It sounds like a lot of fun. Starts at 9.30 on September 10th and ends at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That's a busy day. Oh, it is. There's it is. a lot going on in that it day. It is. It is. And we well, cook barbecue and we cook Brunswick stew and we have... A delicious thing. One lady makes apple jacks to sell, and she sells wow. out pretty quickly. Is that distillery running during no, that day? No. Oh, I was just checking. <laughs> if people want more information about the museum, is there a website they could visit? And although we're open on Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sunday afternoons, I'm available if I'm home. That's for wonderful. anyone passing through. That's wonderful. That shows your commitment. And we have people last weekend from uh, Florida, and we had people in South Carolina and Seattle, Washington, that passed by last week. It's How wonderful. Nice. How nice. It's fun. Well, Bill, thank you so much for having us out. And thank you for the job you're doing and sharing our agricultural history with, with folks. We thank really you. appreciate that. I enjoy it. We'll be right back. This week, we take a look at growing your own garlic. David Giannino is with the Allegheny Mountain Institute. He shows us how as we go in the garden at the Virginia School for the Deaf and the Blind in Stanton. Hi, my name is David Giannino, and I am the urban farm manager uh, for Allegheny Mountain Institute. And we're located at the Virginia School for the Deaf and Blind here in Stanton, Virginia. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about how do you grow your own garlic. Yes, you can grow your own garlic here in Virginia. Uh, it's a wonderful crop. Uh, if you have finished up your summer harvests, finish up your summer crops, you're done with tomatoes, or you're getting sick and tired of your summer crops, or even your spring crops, garlic is a great crop that you can put in you know, at the end of the summer, towards the fall, and then you can put it in the ground and leave it in all winter long and then you reap the benefits next summer. And so what we have here in front of you is a, a, a variety trial of many different types of garlics that we planted last uh, September and this is finally coming to the fruition. Uh, but garlic is a great crop. You can order bulbs online and you can get a, two varieties overall. There's what's called a soft neck garlic and a hard neck garlic and you get different flavors and different attributes depending on if it's a soft or a hard neck garlic. But overall, it's dealer's choice. It's up to either sweetness or spiciness if you like. Um, but here what we've done is we have planted a long 50 foot row of garlic and we have them about eight inches apart in three different rows. Uh, we've irrigated them with drip tape uh, that has, we've got two lines of drip tape and it's been plenty enough irrigation for these garlics. Um, what you will do is, towards the end of the summer, you'll buy your bulbs and you will plant them about half an inch to, to an inch down. And then uh, once they start to germinate, you're really going to want to start mulching them with either some straw or an alternative mulch. Uh, we have chosen to go with uh, wheat straw and uh, it, it's nice, it's dense. Uh, you can pull it apart to pull weeds if they come up and then you can put it right back down. But garlic is going to continue to grow over the winter and it's going to be hardy up to about, depending on the variety of course, it will be hardy up to about 10 degrees. So you, you have a, a really great range of temperatures you can grow garlic in. So 
The garlic will grow all winter long if you maintain it and keep it mulched and keep it irrigated. And then what usually happens if you have the garlic that creates scapes, if you want to look right here at this curly cue, this is called a scape. And garlic will shoot up this scape that you can actually harvest and use it for culinary cooking. Uh, it's sweet, it's got that garlic flavor, and it's delicious in a uh, multitude of different uh, items. But once that has done scaped, you will cut that off. But once you're ready to harvest, this garlic is going to be delicious. You're going to put it up and dry it. You'll put it up and keep it in a nice, cool, dry spot. Uh, and thank you for listening about how to grow garlic. And once again, my name is David Janino with Allegheny Mountain Institute. Our pearl of wisdom this week, it comes in from an anonymous viewer who says, you can't do anything about the length of your life. You can, however, do something about the width and depth. Send in your own pearl of wisdom through our website at virginiafarming.com. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishy for Virginia Farming. And now for your ag trivia question of the week. The answer when we return. Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security. Hi, I'm Jeff Ishy, And I'm Amy Rocher with Virginia Farming. We'd like to invite you to become more involved with the show by submitting your own video reports. If you're involved with a non-commercial organization such as Young Farmers, FFA, a county farm bureau, or perhaps a, a commodity organization associated with Virginia agriculture, you can submit your own video report to be considered for our program. Video reports should be 60 to 90 seconds and recorded in high definition. It's simple. Just use your smartphone set on 1080p at 30 frames per second. Always, always shoot in the horizontal mode and keep the background noise down if possible. And the file format should be MOV or MP4. And then just send us a link so we can download it here at our studios. It's just that easy. In 60 to 90 seconds, tell us what's going on with your organization and how it relates to Virginia agriculture. Contact us about specific video requirements at our website, virginiafarming.com. We look forward to seeing your video reports on Virginia Farming. Check out Virginia Farming on Facebook. Virginia Farming's Facebook page is a great way to stay connected with Virginia agriculture. You might even find some humor there too. You'll find links to events and happenings all over the Commonwealth that are of interest to farmers and consumers alike. So connect with us and share your stories and photos with the Virginia farming community and keep up to date on all things agriculture. Virginia Farming on Facebook. 
you like to put your business in front of rural America and the ag community every week? We have sponsorship opportunities available that will do just that. Get in touch with us to hatch a new plan. And now the answer to your trivia question of the week. Virginia has 44,700 farms covering more than 8 million acres. According to the Virginia Department of Agriculture, this represents 32% of all Virginia. <laughs>